Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. <coughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here. Not only because I like uh, Stanford, and I've been, as uh, Richard said very well, I've been uh, at Stanford for a number of years now, since 1988. Let me uh, brief you, uh, give you the context of the presentation tonight in, uh, in, uh, to follow what uh, uh, was just said. I started to be interested in Asia in the early 60s and went to Japan for five years. And when I, re at that time, if you remember, 61, 67, 62, 67, it was the Olympics, was, uh, Japan was uh, <coughs> resurrecting. And uh, when I returned to Europe in um, 67, I realized I went to a business school uh, called INSEAD. And I went there because I thought uh, that uh, <coughs> Uh, the state of the planet was not so good at that time, and it's even worse now. Uh, but uh, if the state of the planet was so bad, uh, maybe we could do something with uh, chief executive business leaders because they have a great amount of responsibility for what is happening in the world. So I decided to go to a business school and then to work with uh, uh, MBAs and uh, chief executive and so forth. And I realized at that time that the Europeans were rather ignorant about Japan and about Asia, generally speaking. Uh, so I uh, built a center for uh, <coughs> Asian research called the Euro-Asia Center, which I run for a number of years until 1988. And then at that time, I realized that uh, uh, it was quite important to, to try to un enhance the understanding of Asia in Europe, particularly the responsibility dimension. And at that time, if you remember in the 1990s, as then the interest in Japan shifted because Japan got into a number of uh, problems at that time. And um, I concentrated on observing China. China was just <coughs> emerging from the Cultural uh, Revolution. And then uh, on that, uh, in watching what was happening, I could see there was, a, of course, this fantastic growth, this extraordinary development, the speed of taking 600, so many people out of poverty. It was wonderful. But at the same time, there was a number of dysfunction. And then uh, <coughs> I thought that uh, maybe I could uh, spend some time in China to work with a senior executive. And maybe uh, on a very small scale, on a very, very modest scale, I could uh, <coughs> influence as a way of handling uh, and managing state-owned enterprise or private companies. And uh, <coughs> I decided at that time to go to, to Shanghai to CIB CIBS, which was uh, the best, which is probably one of the best business schools in, in China. And they gave me freedom to develop a center for leadership and responsibility. So I started to, I started to work there with uh, MBAs and also with middle managers in executive education, and also with chief executive. And out of that, I have learned a number of things about uh, <coughs> China. And I would like to share with you, uh, in that context, what I have learned, and how, does it, how is this relevant, uh, given the subject that uh, uh, Richard is developing in this, uh, in this center, and particularly in this course. So I was asked to talk about uh, some of the consequences of the economic slowdown, and uh, then about corruption. Uh, so that's what I will do. First, I will say a few words about um, the slowdown and uh, suggest that um, though we all know of uh, many issues that the Japan is confronted to, or is, uh, uh, <coughs> we, uh, <coughs> we should realize that the government is quite aware. And the government is uh, very keen to do something about it. And it has, as you have, as you have seen in the media over the last few years, the government particularly with a new team, very keen to try to take action. And uh, <clears throat> they want to encourage a private business. They want to help a small and medium-sized enterprise. They want to decrease the importance of SME, of a SOE. And uh, <clears throat> they want to simplify the administration to make it easier for the entrepreneur to start, to having not this so complex bureaucratic system, which is very time consuming. They wanted to modify the tax system. So they have very rich, uh, diverse plans to, to alleviate some of the problems which exist for the entrepreneur with uh, developing his business in China. They want to decentralize, to give more uh, responsibility to the province, but at the same time, they centralize some other things. So it's a kind of complex, uh, we decentralize, but at the same time, for a few things, we will uh, uh, do it in, in Beijing because we want to avoid some of the things which happen in the province. It's better to do it in Beijing. Um, and uh, they want to apply the law. They say, you know, we need to be rule, uh, we need to have the rule of the law to be the, the gospel of for development. 
And I think it is a challenge. It is a challenge to do that for, for, for the <coughs> technocrat, the expert, or the party member in Beijing. Uh, and uh, there are a number of um, these functions which uh, uh, are quite uh, visible today. And uh, to manage at the same time a transformation of China, to make China more open to startups, to entrepreneurs, to cultivate innovation. At the same time, uh, we realize that there are some decisions which have been made which are not really conducive to this uh, creative development, this innovation um, environment where you can uh, develop uh, <coughs> a number of uh, new initiatives. Uh, so <coughs> I um, then, uh, uh, then I understand the logic of the, uh, clearly, <coughs> The management of in, in China realized that innovation is a, is a, is a must. Uh, you cannot uh, capitalize too long for their cheap labor, and uh, uh, soon this uh, reservoir of uh, workers coming from the uh, countryside uh, is going to dry a little bit because they will go not anymore to the east coast, but they will go into the new cities which are developing in the, in the central China. And uh, so we, we need to develop productivity if we want to cope with uh, the consequence of our aging population. We will have less people in the age of working. We really need to cultivate innovation. <clears throat> so uh, I think that offers a number of opportunities for the entrepreneur, who is the one who, after being educated here, or someone who has been educated in China, to start his own enterprise and to develop <coughs> a startup. In many, as I said here, you, you could see, I see many opportunities in these uh, sectors, in these particular sectors. Uh, and and uh, the, um, the government is, is pushing into that direction and want to walk the talk. Not only to say, we are going to do this, we are going to do that, we are going to clean up the country, we are going to clean up the environment, we are going to stop pollution and so forth. They are really trying to do something about it. I will take one of the issues, because that was uh, what I was invited to, 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 to talk about, which is this uh, corruption issue. Uh, when I was at, uh, in China, I discussed with uh, EMB, I, I told the EMBAs at length for, for nearly six years, uh, EMBA are, uh, you know, this, for those of you who are not familiar, EMBA are the kind of uh, <coughs> evening courses or weekend courses. They, it's a group of uh, 60, 60 at a time. They come uh, about 16 times on a two-year period for four days each month. So they come Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then they return to company. <coughs> and so on. They do that a number of times. And um, I was uh, doing some uh, teaching in that uh, for, for, for years. And, when I discuss about corruption, which I saw corruption as a real issue, I think corruption pollutes so many different dimensions of uh, the China environment, not only in medical, um, not only with the doctors, but with the university, with, uh, with uh, um, developing a level playing field. It has great impact. So I try to discuss with them, and I was surprised in 2005 to 2010 that they told me, well, it has always existed, you know, corruption is not really a problem, it's, it's not hurt the development. Look at where we are, everyone comes to China and says, oh, it's wonderful, how extraordinary development you have. Uh, it exists everywhere, you have it in your country, and in fact we do, we have a few ministers in jail in uh, my country. And, mm -hmm. Or you could say, uh, they, uh, they say, well, it, it is a hang up of the West. They come and they say, oh, but this is corruption. In fact, it is not corruption, it is a parallel income distribution system. Or uh, we have no choice. And it's true that, uh, yes, but, uh, you know, if you want to do business, this is the way to do it. And it's all the machine. It works very smoothly. And if I don't, uh, if I don't do it, uh, then uh, I shoot myself in the foot. My competitor uh, probably uh, <coughs> will do better than I do. I don't call it corruption. Uh, I don't do it. I outsource my corruption problem. I have Mr. Fix. He fix it for me. Uh, we have a budget. We plan that. This is the way... Uh, and in your country, you give a tip. In my country, we give a top. It's about the same. Uh, but I, at that time, I told them, but you know, your prime minister is a bit uh, has a different view. He, he says, we've got to do something about it. And they say, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they talk, yes, yes, in Beijing. You're right, in Beijing, yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's OK. And um, then five years later, uh, <laughs> we could see that the government says it, it is really a problem. Uh, we really need to do something about it. 
we got to catch up a few people. Uh, we, 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 it has all kind of dysfunction, image, uh, income distribution, uh, uh, <coughs> bending the law. And, uh, so we need to do something about it. And they walk the talk. <coughs> and then uh, Li Keqiang, more recently, said, uh, you know, we, uh, as a new team, said, we really need to do something about it. And we are going to do it. Uh, and uh, they explained the reason why. They said, you know, it has all kinds of uh, negative consequences, and we want to be a country where there is a rule of law. So, <clears throat> uh, <coughs> Xi Jinping, in the same way, uh, says uh, we got to catch not only the small fly, but also the tigers. And uh, <coughs> they actually uh, walk the talk. They, they catch a few people, and <coughs> in fact, quite a few. And put them in jail, or uh, <coughs> sometimes shorten a bit their life. Uh, uh, sometime uh, <coughs> more recently, he said, you know, of course it's difficult to do that, but we have to do it. We have to do, we have to clean up uh, and uh, catch a few tigers. Uh, and a few, we don't know exactly what will happen, but, uh, but uh, some uh, die in jail, uh, like uh, <coughs> uh, Sukhayu, who, who was... Uh, uh, but... Uh, <coughs> Government has tried to, to say, you know, we not only talk about it, like previous generation of leaders, not only we talk, but um, we are going to do something about it. And that is one of the latest cases, as you have heard. Uh, well, that was a tiger. That was really the tiger of the tiger, or bo boxy lie before was also. A... So <clears throat> this illustrates the fact that um, aware of the issues, uh, <coughs> having a full power now, Xi uh, Jinping has all power, he can really implement what he says he will want to implement, and he does. Uh, a number of uh, people have been uh, brought up, uh, <coughs> and it has all kind of consequences for entrepreneurs. Uh, <coughs> uh, not only they try to catch uh, those who are in, um, in uh, outside uh, China, but um, they um, also uh, want to make sure uh, that uh, they catch uh, those who are most visible. Whether they are uh, those who don't share with you or not, we, we have to log them up. Um, so I think it has had, uh, several important consequences. It has changed the mindset of the civil servant, of the officials. Uh, not only, you know, you cannot play golf now, they are, you are told uh, golf is uh, not, uh, of course, officially, it's because we don't have enough water. So, so because we have not enough water, we cannot maintain those golf clubs, and therefore, uh, but anyway, civil servants should not go into golf uh, because, uh, you know, this is a nest for developing personal relationship, which is, uh, um, and then luxury, you, you have seen that in the pressure on EMBA. You know, we, we see now, CIBS for instance, that um, EMBA, the, the number of participants in EMBA, those executives I was mentioning earlier, uh, now they drop in the middle of their program, so two year, when you're going to have a, a program, they drop in the middle. And you say, why don't you, why did you stop? And they say, well, my boss told me, oh, now we are not supposed to go to those courses, because those courses are the nest for corruption. Because uh, during those courses, you have the civil servant, uh, or uh, provincial, <coughs> or local, or city, or, or uh, from Beijing, who develop with private entrepreneur a friendly relationship. And the government thinks that uh, this is um, the seed for uh, uh, corruption. So they have to ask to refrain. And now they ask business school to refund them from uh, the tuition fee because they have not completed the course. But that's another uh, issue. Um, many government officials are sanctioned. Uh, they will have to declare their personal asset. Uh, uh, this is not so pleasant for some of them. Uh, they also complain that uh, their income is uh, going to shrink a little bit. Uh, we have more cases of... Uh, uh, civil servant who decide to shorten their life, and, and uh, <clears throat> the civil service job is maybe less, less attractive because now you cannot get the benefit that you used to have before through this uh, parallel uh, distribution. And uh, but it has also a benefit, uh, you know, for normal citizen. 
they have now easier access officially to it's slow well, it's slow maybe decision making because people don't dare to make decisions. But in terms of administrative and red tape, as I said earlier, the government wants to decrease red tape. So uh, <coughs> for, for the uh, citizen, it, it is a benefit, and maybe the the, the, the party will get some uh, the party will get some. Uh, better image because they said you know they are trying to catch up those uh, who are uh, uh, <clears throat> somewhat delinquent in terms of uh, income gathering and uh, this is a good thing it will clean up the place so <clears throat> it has potential benefit uh, whether it will have a long term in, in fact maybe uh, June will tell us a little bit more about it but can I uh, ask let me ask one follow-up question, okay, before we switch over to June. And my follow-up question is that, you know, in a business culture like China where guanxi <laughs> is a part of doing business, probably the sort of distinction between corruption and acceptable guanxi really is a relative thing that depends on the sort of social acceptability in a particular situation. <laughs> And yeah, it, that's remarkably well understood inside a culture. If you do more than this, it's a bribe. If you don't, if you do up to this point, then that's looking out for each other, you know, taking care of each other's uh, hedging risk or whatever. But do you see the, the, more clarity in this, or do you think that the new system is actually less clear? Well, it, it, it has to do with where do you draw the line. You know, if I invite you for lunch and we have a nice lunch together because we want to do business or you want to obtain some authorization from me and we, we have a nice lunch, this is probably all right. If you give me a couple of Rolex and then you fly my, my children uh, to, to or, or pay the tuition of my children at Stanford, uh, I mean, uh, I would say that is a bit too much. So where do we say, this is okay, this is a bit on the fringe, this is too far. And currently... The government wanted to be extremely strict, and uh, then uh, to say the rule of the game is you cannot, and <coughs> you cannot receive this. And many says, uh, but that's nice to say, but uh, you know we, we we need to do it for all kind of including the tradition, including the gift giving. We are in a society where we exchange gift. It's a norm of reciprocity. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. You give me this authorization, and I give you a, a box of uh, XO. Uh, yeah, okay. We can come back to this point. Because I think this is one of the most key points to really consider, is what's socially acceptable and what isn't, right? In the meantime, I'd like to ask June if you would give us your comments. I think we can switch over automatically to your slides. Right. And I like your title, The New Normal in China. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I can't speak um, at the broad, as broad, micro level as uh, as Professor uh, Henry. Yeah. Very difficult name. Very difficult name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will speak uh, from my own experience. So first of all, I was born in um, kind of in the 70s. I I spent most of my time um, study in China. Uh, I came to U United States in 1997 um, to pursue graduate school, and and ever since I stayed in U.S. But every once in a while, uh, actually quite frequently, I travel back to China. And now I work for this Chinese-based company uh, for almost eight years, and I actually experienced a, quite a bit wave. I'm going to which I'm going to talk about, uh, which related to the entrepreneurship. Yeah. So can we go to the next? Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, before I jump into answering, actually, before I come to this uh, talk, uh, you know, Professor Richard uh, Dasher actually uh, asked me to talk about today's topics related to the entrepreneurship, the, the new economics and the happening in China. And uh, so before I answer that, let me give you a quick you know, one minute intro about uh, Beyondsoft. So Beyondsoft is a kind of an exemplar of a Chinese enterprise that was founded in 1995, about 20 years ago. And uh, it started uh, with providing software, actually, the labors uh, to do the computer you know, developer testing work. And we actually went public in China 
uh, at first uh, we want to go public in US. This is happening in 2008. Uh, but we run into, you know, economy, you know, uh, economic problems. problems. Yeah. yeah, so we couldn't go public here. At that time, we have a uh -huh. difficult time to raise money. And then uh, in 2009, we actually made a decision to uh, go public in China. And, you know, because of accounting issue, we spent a, 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 the accounting difference between US and China, we spent like two years to create, I mean, to work on our accounting issue. So, um, end of story, we went public in 2012. Uh, and now, the, you know, the company is growing really well. Um, at the current stage, um, we did really well among all of our competitors. However, uh, in terms of the consulting outsourcing business in China, we run into a huge issue, which is the, the, the labor cost in China has gone up so hugely. So the company is in need of uh, transformation. That's why we actually formed the US startup investment, which I am currently leading. Um, so that's a kind of a brief history of, uh, of Beyondsoft. Uh, currently, the company is 9,000 people uh, worldwide. Uh, we, uh, we are a public company. Uh, we have a global, uh, global delivery center uh, in, in China, in, in US, uh, in Japan, uh, in Singapore, in, in India, uh, and also uh, a few offices in, oh, and also in Canada. And we actually did uh, several merge and acquisition, including US company, including Canadian companies, uh, including Indian companies. So the, you know, we're pretty proud, uh, pretty proud of ourselves as a global company. We grow pretty well, but however, we also are facing uh, the challenge of how we continue to lead in this market. Um, so um, to answer, um, the Professor Dasher's question. Let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about the, the five waves of uh, entrepreneurship happened uh, in China uh, since 1949. Um, some I, exper I have personal experience, some, uh, some you know, I don't. For example, the first one, the 1978, that's the kind of the, the first uh, wave of innovation happens, uh, startups and waves. Uh, that is when. Um, the government decided to lose the control, give the control back to the peasants, to the to farmers. So th that time, the startups are happening in, in the suburb areas. When people actually ha have controls of their land, they decide that they don't have to form this kind of conglomerate teams. And uh, uh, they have their own individual drives to, to, uh, to plan what to, what, what to farm. And the second wave is happening. The, unfortunately, the first one I didn't experience. I was too young. <laughs> uh, but the second one, um, which is happening in 1984, I was still pretty young. I, I wasn't part of it. Um, but I observed that during that time, the Chinese actually have, have the open door policy. And at that time, my dad was one of the first uh, uh, kind of uh, wave to go to uh, Shenzhen area. Uh, he's an architect. Uh, at that time, uh, there are a lot of happenings, uh, Shenzhen being the first uh, city in the entire China to try out this open door policy. And, and during, uh, at that time, uh, it, in that wave, uh, many uh, new companies, such as the higher, uh, you, you might, some of you might hear is the, one of the Chinese uh, electronic um, brand that they sell the you know, TVs, they sell the uh, refrigerators. Um, so at that time, the manufacturer, uh, man manufacturers and, and factories, uh, that is when the startup wave, uh, you know, mostly in place. And China becomes the, one of the, uh, the global uh, center for the manufacturing. And, and I think in the past 20 years, uh, you, you would see, you know, the, the huge labor surplus and advantage that actually impact the Chinese growth today. Uh, so in 1984, that's when uh, the manufacturing um, and startups and the opportunity happens. Uh, and in the third wave comes in 1992. And that time, uh, I, I was in college. Um, so that way was led by the, the China elite knowledge worker. Um, so the, at that time, the, you know, again, the policy becomes you know, even broadly opened. 
and in real estate, in insurance, in education, um, you know, we see the entrepreneurs and those that are really knowledgeable people. So unlike the first two, and uh, farmers or, or you know the factory the leaders, and this third wave was led by the knowledge worker. One of the example is called uh, this company called the New Oriental, um, Xin Dongfang. So uh, I think at that time, uh, almost all the students who wants to come to U.S. to study, they have to, uh, you know, uh, receive education from this uh, from this firm because they provide English training, exam training, and they become so popular. And at that time, I was in college. Actually, <laughs> I I have taken their class and to prepare to come uh, for coming to U.S. And the for the fourth wave. Um, is the internet wave, um, and I think the the people who led this uh, is actually my age, or uh, maybe a little older than me. So the current the uh, uh, the three largest internet company in China, uh, we call it a BAT, uh, Baidu, Tencent, Tencent, and Alibaba. They're all the, the founders and CEOs are all born in that in that uh, in, in a little older than me, or like my age. Um, and they founded the company during that time. And the la you know, the fifth wave, and I would say is now, or it's actually, I think this wave will be led by uh, the millennials, uh, the people who were born after 1980s and after 1990s. And in my own opinion, um, uh, the, the opportunity will be that because the new, basically, the new generations, they are experiencing the, everything different from my age or, or the older age because the, uh, when they were born, when they're growing up, and the, you know, social internet are just, the, you know, they take it for granted, and the, they they were brought up by connected to the social networks, right? And and their opinion towards the world is also, you know, much open. And also the applied to the traditional uh, industries because of the uh, innovation of internet, the way people are are dealing, doing the business are so different. So I would say this way, you know, we would see traditional business will be dis disrupted. Um, you know, coming to the opportunity, for example, the O2O is very, very popular in China. O2O stands for online to offline, and you know, because of China's huge populations and and you will see the opportunities of having, uh, you know, the, the, like uh, new services, uh, delivery services come to your doorsteps. Um, you know, this this the, is one of the way to disrupt the uh, the business, and also the marketplace, like uh, you know, Ubers, and we have similar uh, enterprise in China called DD uh, software. Um, that's uh, the the marketplace is actually also disrupted the traditional way of uh, doing the business. Yeah, so can we go to the next one? Um, so, you know, why why is this happening? Uh, in my own opinion, uh, because the past twenty years, um, the China's huge growth was due to the labor surplus. The cost of the the labor is so low. Uh, so the first is it happening in the manufacturer. Later is the in the uh, you know for example in my industry is the software outsourcing. Uh, you know I joined the company in 2007, uh, but the company actually outsourcing uh, industry in China was booming in 2006 to 2008. Uh, you know it's just uh, at that time. Uh, you know, it's so easy to get new business because everybody wants to outsource to China. You know, we got talents. We, you know, we got the, you know, uh, a huge market of the talents and trained, trained the software engineers. Uh, so, and also at the one fifth of the cost mm -hmm. of the U.S. here, right? So at that time, you know, it's such a easy uh, thing to to kind of convince the customers. They have, and uh, you know, have your have a team in China. You know, they're smart. They're really hardworking. Uh, but if we look at today, you know, the the cost that has in China has been continuously go up. Right and and a lot of clients saying, hey, you know, considering about the communication has hassles and uh, this latencies and uh, you know, it's not as attractive as before. 
and that's a, one challenge we're facing. The second challenge is the you know all the market in China are so growing so well, and all the talents that we used to be, uh, you know, if the, if a worker quit the job from us, they will go to competitors, mm -hmm. and or they want to come to the U.S. But now it's not like that. The first choice is go to the Baidu, Tencent, and, and Alibaba, or or even work for the state-owned company. You know, you know, they have they seem to um, have better opportunity instead of the, you know working for uh, even the, like multinational companies. Yeah. So right now, you know, the labor talents uh, is scarce even in China for the China market. So it, it which presented a, a pretty challenging job for us, right? And and look at the entire China. So in the past 20 years, you know, we have this huge labor surplus, but nowadays it's a little different. And also the fundamental of the uh, the country in the past was built on the manufacturing advantage, mm -hmm. but now it's changed because of the environmental issue, because of the, the huge surplus. And so the the the, comp the country itself needs to change uh, to have a, to develop a new core competency in the global uh, competition. However, we also have so many people that we need to feed to make sure <laughs> they have jobs, right? So we can't say, hey, the, all the factories we cut down uh, because we don't have that needs. Um, but then you know, so many people will be out of job, right? So the the, the country itself actually, the new leader has a pretty challenging job to do. Um, so that's why you know the, you see this new policy come out uh, because the, the economy needs to be restructured. Uh, probably to, towards the service, more service the industry being developed instead of the manufacturing, um, it, you know, due to the labor cost increase. And second of all, the, I think the, the assets need to be reallocated. The, the country itself uh, really promotes uh, entrepreneurship now. Uh, they want individuals to... Um, uh, to really be creative, to be proactive, uh, you know, uh, doing the job. That's why you see all this new policy come out and the encouragement of the the entrepreneurship. I think to the individuals, uh, I would say it's a great great time to start a company in China. Uh, there's so many assets. Uh, that you know the the capitals around. I think that because of the surplus that's accumulated in the past 20, 20 years, and in, in the individuals, in the and also the uh, like, uh, the companies have collected a huge asset. They need to reinvest into the future, right? So when that actually you see, uh, you, you know, so many companies are doing what. I am doing uh, is actually creating fund uh, or participating in fund so that because they want to invest in the new technologies uh, because the old uh, com competence and uh, competitive advantage no longer exist mm -hmm. and that we have to make sure that we continue to invest in in the talents in the, in the new innovations mm -hmm. um, so so it's a great time to for the individuals to uh, to start a company in China. Uh, and to the enterprise, I, I would say a lot of them are doing investment. Uh, when I actually uh, started this new role, actually I took a trip back to China, talked to all of my uh, you know friends who are doing investments who are connected in this. And you know I was I was from Beijing, so I spent some time in Beijing. I visited the incubator. You would be amazed that how many incubators yeah, there are yeah. it's like it's like a silicon valley you know across the street you see you see quite a few you know coffee shops that are actually incubators and and i think beijing was growing really fast to be probably the world's second you know innovative place in the whole world right it's just growing so fast um, yeah so uh how much time do i have can we get into the impact right? yeah so can we go to the next slides? Yeah. So um, so Professor Dasher asked me, um, you know, whether whether the anti-corruption will impact um, the overseas direct investment, right? Um, and and I I would say uh, if you say that will if anti-corruption will decrease the overseas investment, that that means 
there's assumption that in the past, the you know corruption actually supported the overseas investment. I don't know, but I, you know personally, I would say this the uh, anti corruptions will not uh, impact or will not uh, decrease how the overseeing uh, no, investment happens. Mostly, yeah. Are you thinking mostly about outgoing overseas investment from China or about incoming? Overseas investment to China. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, outgoing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, from my own experience, um, there are a lot of the capitals that are looking for uh, investment overseas. Um, one is to kind of di diversify the risk, right? You can't just uh, invest everything within China. Um, because that's too risky. Uh, a lot of valuation in China is already pretty high, and and also the channel of the investment are limited. Um, uh, so uh, and also if you look at the government the policies actually supporting this action, uh, the country itself actually really encourage uh, the enterprise uh, uh, to do more overseas investment. And like in February this year, and I was. I was looking at the, my WeChat. And somebody posted this for me. Uh, it's actually the uh, uh, it's for uh, like uh, administration of foreign exchange mm -hmm. uh, in China. Mm -hmm. Actually, published a policy in February that they can. It used to be if a firm wants to do the overseas investment, then they will have to ha filing some approval to get approval from the foreign exchange, uh, you know, bureau. But now um, they actually lose the control. They said they no longer to, need to do that, and everything needs to happen at the bank. So they actually the, make sure the policy is actually com very similar to what is happening here. And they, they simplified the process that made it the, the form is much easier to do future uh, in, you know, investment here. You know? and, and I was so excited, I, I sent it to our CEO and immediately. He gave the thumbs up, and, yeah, because that's just to make it, the process much simpler. Yeah, that's just the one example. It's actually the, the China government is actually the, really supporting uh, the firms and, and capitals to do the overseas investment. And, uh, yeah. and um, and also the the trend I have seen is the, the you know a lot of VCs I talked to you you know uh, they really look into China market and supporting that and 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 also in addition they're actively looking uh, for talents and IPs uh, you know and and teams and are able to operate. Uh, in in the global market, and, or they can come back to China and support the future growth of China. So one example, uh, I think recently there's the acquisition of the Segway. Uh, I, I think most of the people probably are familiar with that. This kind of the, the, uh, yeah. So Segway was acquired by this Chinese company called uh, uh, Nibot. Yeah, so that's I think that uh, because Nibot believes that the acquisition will actually uh, allow them to gain uh, the IP access and also allow them to be able to expand in the global market. I think. Can you tell us a little more about the acquiring Chinese company? Who are who is Nibot? Uh, are they really big? Uh, I believe they uh, they're uh, they're growing really fast. It's number one. The, mm -hmm. They do similar things as in the Segway, um, but primarily only in China. Yeah, and I think the I heard the machine was in the, used by policemen, uh, police department, and something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. I have just kind of a follow up for you. If I am to understand what you think is the new normal in China more disruptive business, more disruptive business ideas. And that's a yeah. huge change, right? Because if you're disrupting business ideas, then that is a threat to the existing power relationships, at least in the corporate world, not necessarily in the government, right? But one of the reasons for a lot of the intensely personal nature of business in China was essentially protecting your business position. Mm where you don't rely as much on court cases of intellectual property infringement as you do on who you know who will administer um, some legal action. 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think the coming to the China culture, uh, human relationship is always going to be very, very important, right? And, but in terms of dealing into the business, you see more impact when you, if you, you are going to have a startup, you will see relationship is more important when you do B2B business than B2C business. Right, so some of the disruptive uh, way I see is that they actually shorten the the flow. Uh, there maybe used to be so many middlemen that actually uh, the new process actually get rid of the middlemen. So that yeah. exactly sets up my next question. Yeah. Are you seeing more new B two C plays, startup companies, or are you seeing a lot of activity in the B two B space? I think in both, but B two B will be sm slower because uh, uh, you know, if you look at the what uh, the five five waves that I was talking about in the past, uh, you know the, the most startups prevail in the area where is less control. So less control means the, the it's actually the it, it's more like a free market and people can you know. The startups in China actually compete at the much more intense level than here. If you have one startup doing things, a good thing and making money, there will, tomorrow you will find maybe four or five doing similar things. So you really have to compete in the operational level. And yeah. I think in, in, the, in the B2C area, there's actually less control and allow more try fail this. And that's why you actually see more opportunities there. And B2B is still you know, controlled by uh, by frequency or relations, I think that that's a, that's a, even same in U.S. Because when you have when you're working in the large enterprise, you know I I want to work with you for a long time, ten years, twenty years. So that's why uh, whether you're credible is very very important. It's different from B two C. You know I I put an order um, on your platform. If I it's a bad transaction, I just forget it and I walk away. But in in the B two B you know, area, you know, the risk is much higher. So I, that's why, you know, yeah, Chinese okay. people associate the guanxi with credibilities and, you know, because there's no such, uh, uh, the, the, yeah, okay. the credit system yeah. is not So there. let me yeah. step in for a second and uh, point out that um, both of our panelists have said that in some ways the increase in transparency and increase in sort of better business processes that you can expect from the corruption crackdown, maybe that's also intensified by an economic slowdown where you have to be more efficient, you have to be more careful. That's one thing, but I, what's really at the center of my question for both of you, and let's start with the question, if you're starting a company in China, is it easier to get market access under the current situation, or is was it easier to get market access five or ten years ago? And I think that market access is a key, and you really do need to look separately at B2C versus B2B. Mm. Okay. Um, Professor de Bettinier? Just a note on your comment, uh, your previous comment on the role of the personal relationship and uh, what uh, we uh, just heard from June. Uh, I think for the startup, for the young entrepreneur who um, develops his business, it, it is more difficult for him to have access to uh, government connection and, uh, than if you work for a large uh, uh, SOE. Uh, and therefore, there is a kind of handicap because your social capital, your capacity to influence and to accelerate decision is a bit uh, more modest than if you work for a well-known either a multinational or for a, <coughs> a state-owned enterprise. Now, that was a, on, on that particular point. On the transparency <coughs> and, and the fact that the government is pushing for transparency, is that a consequence <coughs> of the economic slowdown? Uh, yes and no. I think yes, it is, because uh, the government realized that um, if the economy is going below 7%, uh, 6.8, or, or this is going to create a number of employment problems. As uh, June said, uh, we need to create a job for all those graduates who come out of university and to make sure that we have enough to, 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 to give them something. And if the economy goes down, the job creation is going to be maybe a bit uh, more modest. And therefore, we need to do everything to prevent this to happen. One way, 
is to try to uh, attract more um, uh, foreign investors or to have more development here through more transparency. Because everyone complained that the lack of transparency, the opacity of the system, uh, slow down decision, prevent some decision to be made. So if we really want to get this economy increasing productivity and uh, coping with, uh, with the res not the recession, but coping with the decrease of the activity, we need to, uh, transparency will be a, a useful instrument. It will give uh, more access to um, foreign company to what we are doing. It will give us a better image. It will accelerate possibly the decision making process. In reality, it may not uh, achieve that because the civil servant, as I said, seems to be now a little bit more reluctant to take decision because uh, you know we might uh, <coughs> get into uh, some sticky situation. Uh, um, so uh, initially, this uh, transformation of the economy, this, this uh, reform that the government is bringing, may not bring immediately the expected uh, result, expected outcome. Partly because people don't quite know how to go through the process of reform. If it slows down decision making, that would be a negative impact, right? And the province, you know, the province as they send those people in Beijing, you know, on top of the mountain, to telling them what to do. They have always been a bit reluctant to implement decisions from the central government. So now that the central government is having this very strong uh, 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 behavior toward a certain type of uh, um, corporate or individual behavior, if you are in the province, uh, uh, yes, you will say, yes, okay, we will change, we will... Uh, Adopt uh, well, adapt to what the government wants, but uh, very reluctantly. So it may create some antagonism, if not antagonism, some resentment. Uh, you know, some of my friends are now in jail. You know, some of my friends have to uh, unclose themselves, or somewhere in the United States have been brought back. So uh, today I will be very careful. I don't want to be caught into this process. Now that's mostly the attitudes of people in the public sector, in the government mm. sector, mm. right? In the business sector, are people more concerned because of this or are they more aggressive because of this? I don't want to monopolize it. I'm, I'm <laughs> looking at both of you. I could, I'll, either, either person. Oh, gee, that's a tough question. <laughs> um... Well, that, yeah, that's a very difficult question. I, I think the, the you know anti anti corruptions um, may may made things hard to do. Uh, you know, because in the past it's, it's either people have in, incentives <laughs> to do yeah, things, right. right? And the one thing now is the you know where's the incentives and uh, the negative. The downside <laughs> is obvious. The upside is less clear. Yeah, but the uh, <laughs> but the government officials uh, these days also have uh, uh, very, very strict KPIs. You know, key performance indicator. You know whether you perform or not perform. And if you want to go through go up in the chain, you have to actually show real uh, performance, right? So if you act. You know, is that obviously typically not in terms doing the number anything. of jobs that are created in your district, or the number of jobs created in your district, the amount of taxes from your district? No, you KPIs really, no, for No, they have to. Official. They have to show. You know, what's the economic uh, economic growth so you have okay. brought it to the area. But and, not only yeah. now, is precisely because of that, the government is uh, trying to change. Uh, you see, Shanghai has decided not to reward people <laughs> and to use as a main incentive a quantitative performance and the GNP development for the Shanghai area because they realize that this has perverse effect. Everyone will try to. Uh, yeah. make sure that they deliver because of the KPI is the objective. And in order to do so, I will let company to pollute because uh, if I give them a fine or if I close them, I create unemployment in my, uh, they don't pay taxes and my income is, uh, my income of the city is uh, lower. So I have all incentive to try to go as fast as possible and demonstrate my province is doing better than the other province. And now the government say yes. This has created so many negative consequences, this overinvestment, overcapacity, this uh, all kind of funny thing taking place. Now, we are not going to reward you according to the actual uh, quantitative performance. You will have to include a number of qualitative elements in order that the assessment of your performance will be more comprehensive. So, June, uh, back to this whole point about market access, mm -hmm. especially in the B2B sector. And one reason I'm asking about this is because 
if China follows the same sort of general path of economic development that we saw in Japan and then in South Korea, you're going to see the big companies worried about protecting themselves and not doing a good job of interacting with startup companies. Now, that's a different thing from the economic slowdown itself. But certainly, as an economy advances, you expect a slowing of GDP growth. And, you know, the, the, I think you had a large part of the Japanese economy, a large part of the Korean economy that was essentially controlled by a relatively small number of large companies. And so B2B became not the way to be an entrepreneur in those countries. Mm. Well, in, in China, I think uh, unlike in Japan or, or Korea, uh, the most, I mean, the, the business B2B market was controlled by family. You know, they're privately owned. But in China, it's different. The largest asset was controlled by country. It's a state-owned enterprise. Right, so that's that's a very different. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, there's there's no um, you know private owned enterprise actually are able to control any of the really significant resources. It's actually the, it's up to the country, to, uh, the government to decide, you know how to let the rule play. You know, so for example, in the past, you know uh, the uh, everybody knows China has a really huge environmental issue, right? But in the past, though, you don't see very successful companies actually addressing that. That's because the policy wasn't there. Now we're hoping that in the, the current government will it's actually they are yeah. they're actually working very heartily on setting up the policy and have it open, so the start startups actually can start working on that. Yeah. So, Henri Claude, this is an area that you don't hear talked about in the discussion of the crackdown, and that's the the heads of the SOEs, mm -hmm. are they acting more like public employees or are they acting more like private business people? Oh, they are certainly acting more than the, the state-owned enterprises, civil servant types. They have a very comfortable lives. They are not so competitive. They are very well protected. Some of them are because of the monopoly situation. So they are very comfortable. And now the government says, yeah, that is going to change, you know? We are going to open the market, we are going to let private sectors to get into your business in the railroad industry, in different industry, in our private sector can come. That's going to stimulate, and you are overpaid, so we are going to decrease your compensation. You say, oh, well, what is this, and so forth. So I think the, the, the SOE are currently in a rather turbulent era, and their appointment is made by the by the, by the party, mm -hmm. so uh, you have to behave in a way that you make sure your career uh, follow uh, the uh, uh, gospel or the, 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 the uh, will of the party. So I think the, you were mentioning about the relationship between SOE and private and the small startup. Uh, uh, I think now they realize because of the pressure of the government that innovation is a must and they know that the innovation will come probably more from startups than from a big, uh, um, uh, large uh, <coughs> SOE, they will go into that direction. In a way, the, the Sasak is pushing them into that direction. But between what Sasak asks them to do and what they do, there is sometimes uh, some time lag or some dissonance. <coughs> okay, thank you. Let's open up the floor to questions. If you would briefly identify yourself and also say which of our panelists, if or both, you would like to address the question too. Go ahead. I'm Buck G. I, uh, I uh, was a former executive at Cisco Systems. I retired now, but I spent 30 years in the Valley. Um, there, in, in the press, in looking at the anti corruption uh, movement, um, there, there's some skepticism whether it's really anti corruption or whether it's a political purge. I'm just curious what you see and how it's, how it's viewed in, 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 in China. I would say that it is uh, just uh, <coughs> a political um, process to get rid of uh, people who don't share your view. I think that is a much too simplistic interpretation of what is taking place. This may have played a role uh, uh, <coughs> in the case of Boxilai and, and a few well-known uh, cases, but I think there is a, a very... <coughs> a, a, a very personal conviction 
from uh, uh, Li Keqiang and also Xi Jinping that we need to do something for the sake of the country. We are going to lose credibility. If we keep having this corruption endemic everywhere, we are losing credibility. People won't trust us anymore. Our opposition will become very fragile. So we need to clean up our image and to give to the civil society, or not the civil society does not exist today, but to, to, the, to the general public, a sense that uh, we are a clean people at the top. <laughs> and uh, so, and that is, a, a, now, they may also catch up a few of their uh, political, uh, <clears throat> and uh, also those uh, who they think uh, can uh, create, uh, give a bad idea to others, some intellectuals, uh, some journalists, uh, some NGOs, uh, some activists, we will lock them up because they can also create problems. What we need to do is to keep power. And to keep power with a country like this, it is not that easy. And uh, we had better to do something to improve our image because otherwise we remember history. History tells us that what happened in the past was always because of corruption. Corruption has uh, brought down a number of uh, <coughs> previous uh, emperors in the past. So we really need to be careful about this. And now that he has the full power, he can, clean, he, he can do it. <coughs> so there is certainly some element to catch this one, but uh, that's not the... Um, we cannot uh, summarize this activity just to clean up uh, my adversary and put them into the box. How is it viewed in the business, in, in the business sector? It's my question, really. Um, whether is it, it is a yeah. political pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, I, I think from, from the business point of view, um, it, it, it definitely adds some challenges when, when they do business because, the, especially if you're used to deal with the government and uh, you know the old relationships you, know, you build, the trust you build, those people are gone there, and and some of the uh, you don't know. I think one is add uncertainty uh, to the mm -hmm. policy, especially you know if the changes are so huge and you keep wondering, uh, you know, so yeah. Business uses negatively rather than positively. Yeah. Because it was before. Before, it was, you know, if you want to do business uh, with Duna, I will know how to do it. But well, now this system does not work anymore, so I still want to do business with her. But I, I want to try interpreting what you said. I, I think, I think it's the, the doing business, especially if you're dealing with the government business and B2B business, uh, you know, we we got to be careful that. I, but I think that um, the enterprises in China are used to this. Yeah, it, it's it's not like a new. You know, it always has been this way. Jun, let that, me follow up yeah. on this question, okay? Um, as a company grows and becomes a public company in China, mm -hmm. for a while there was a real backlash in the NASDAQ against Chinese companies listing here because they were too opaque. You couldn't really see the internal accounting so well. Do you see this changing? Is this starting to become more transparent in the Chinese companies now? And is this part of this same thing? Are the leaders of the companies now liable for criminal <laughs> problems if, if uh, the company is sort of um, not clean? Well, I think the, if you look at the trend, the definitely company wants to be more transparent, to be professional, be more ethical. The entire country is also like that. You know, anti-corruption will make uh, the way you're dealing business more compliant to the you know uh, ethical way. Um, and I see the in terms of the Western view to the Chinese company, there there's always some opaque uh, that they don't understand that. The understanding is always like that, but uh, there's a wave. Like uh, prior to 2007, or you know, when we actually my company were planning to go IPO here, that time it's like the Western world is the wide openly accept Chinese companies. You see this, so many companies that went public into the Nasdaq, but then you know, in my industry, there's one bad company, <laughs> you know, and then uh, the entire viewpoint just changed. And pr pretty much at that time, all of our competitors who went to the U.S. company, their stock went tr to 
like nothing, and they they have to be privatized and taken back and doing some restructuring or something. Or delisted, yeah. Yeah, and and all of a sudden we become the only public company, <laughs> you know. It, it, and but now you know you see Alibaba, you see new companies, and now I think uh, you know Western world uh, also again started opening their viewpoint because there are some great companies, uh, you know, when public here and so. Okay. Another question from the floor? Okay. Um, one of the former Chinese leaders, I think it was Deng Xiaoping, when asked, what do you think of the French Revolution, replied, we're not sure yet. <laughs> now, that was 200 plus years after the event. So with that in mind, can you help us understand, both of you, do macroeconomists have to write a new textbook because of the fantastic success in China in a new economic system? In the U.S., we're even struggling to define it. Uh, some people call it market socialism, other people call it communist capitalism. Any thoughts? On the one level, that's a really huge question, right? I mean, are we redefining economics? Are you kind of more specific to this whole idea of what is the impact of the current economic change? Well, the corruption crackdown, you could argue, is a, is a move towards, you know, uh, a traditional form of Capitalism. One theory in the West would be that's been talked about in regards to China uh, for decades is you can't have true capitalism until you get democratic reform. Mm. Well, I will leave it. Of course, I have I have a personal and tentative answer to this because, I, as Richard said, it's a very complex. I'll give you I'll give you my answer in a second. But maybe Juni, you want to speak yeah, first? Please first. Well, <laughs> I, I, you know, yes, we, we, we talk about China in terms of uh, social capitalism, capitalism uh, with uh, Chinese character, uh, all, all kinds of words to try to, 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 to capture the essence of a system uh, which is a mix of uh, it's a capitalist system but not really. But yes, it is in many ways, but at the same time it is a communist system. Well, not really, it's more socialist, but so, anyway, so... I think if you, your question is more what is likely to happen. I think there are today three dominant scenarios. One scenario is that they just wait for a while progressively because of the globalization process and technological evolution the, and also the influence of the West. Uh, China will become progressively more and more like us. Uh, because uh, they travel more, they go around the world, they progressively have access to Internet to the rest of the world. So that will change the mindset and the system will evolve, institution will be developed and it will be more a democratic system. Scenario one. Scenario two, if this system cannot last, it's going to blow up, you know, they will have because of the structure of the population, because of the emergence of the middle class, because of the people uh, moving to other parts of the world and coming back with new ideas, all the students coming back from the West American University. And all this is going to create, uh, and thanks to Internet and microblog, it will create a movement and it will, the system will blow up. And at the same time, the recession, the difficulties in Europe and the U.S. will create problems in China. China will have economic difficulties, political difficulties, and then the credibility at the top. So anyway, it is the collapse of the system, possibly a little bit brutal and so forth. So that scenario, it is a no, 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 no. They, they will have a way to cope with this. They have a very strong uh, control system through different kinds of police or other, uh, otherwise. Uh, they will be able to control those man, many manifestations or demonstrations around the, uh, they will control. And uh, <coughs> what will happen is that uh, we will have a capitalist system in the, um, from the outside. We will have a system which will be a kind of uh, Singapore with the steroids. Uh, you know, a big, big Singapore, a Lee Kuan Yew with a very strong hand controlling and uh, not letting really a democratic process develop too quickly. And at the same time, very market-oriented, market-directed, not the hand of the government. And they say that uh, it may happen, uh, which will be an uh, original system. Those uh, in the West who think that uh, democracy is uh, bound to happen, there is no choice, it will come necessarily. Uh, and uh, with uh, the, when you have the middle income level, you will want a democracy. So, so it will go to a democracy. I think this theory is now challenged very significantly. So that is the third scenario. The fourth scenario, if there is one, is um, that uh, something will happen from an enlightened leadership, uh, whether it is uh, with this one or the next generation in, in eight years from now, and they will manage the transition. They will progressively create 
mini party or democratic, democracy at the different levels through election in, and progressively it will come. So they will smoothly develop into a democratic process. I let you choose among the four. I'm actually going to ask to move on to a different topic because that's a great answer. June, I, there's one topic I really want to make sure we get to today and I'd like to start with you on this. What does this mean for people doing startups here in Silicon Valley? Will it be, is it a good time to try to get into China or because it's an economic slowdown, people will uh, be a little bit less willing to work with outside companies, less willing to let outside companies get into the China market? What's, what, how do you see this uh, affecting American entrepreneurs, especially Silicon Valley entrepreneurs? Oh, I, I think it's a great time. It's a great time to to start um, a company in China, um, or if you if you're born in China and you get a study here, you want to go back. That's a perfect time. You, you know, uh, huge huge cap capitals or like that. Uh, we're supporting uh, the startups like that. But if you are uh, you're not you don't have any Chinese background, uh, you have a startup here, you want to grow your market into China. And then you you need to have the right strategy uh, because the uh, what I mean is you need to have uh, the right team to operate in China because the the, the user behaviors the com uh, competitive uh, landscape is very very different in China and if you're born here you don't understand uh, how the user behaves and how the competition is like there you're unlikely to be successful yeah okay excellent go ahead. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing my PhD here right now in uh, electrical engineering. And uh, just a follow-up question: Can you mention, describe more about the right team? Like, what exactly uh, does that mean? Getting a a strong local Chinese person on your team? Uh -huh. or? So, uh, are you thinking about the, the having a startup in China? Yeah, I'm. I'm working on it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Well, I think the team. Uh, when when Chi uh, when the investor look at the the team in China, uh, people is the first, you know the market is second, and I, I think the VC here in in US may reverse the priority, and so the people that how strong your team is are most important thing, and they will look at your background and you know if your technology com companies the technical capabilities, and and also the the way you how how well you can execute in China is also very important. Uh, the learning capabilities, usually, uh, I think in, uh, the philosophy in China is a little different here. Uh, it's usually we look at the founders or CEOs, how strong that person is, how the founder team can, can carry. And unlike here, you know, the VCs, the, they can change to a professional manager of the team, you know, but in China, because of the market policies are so, uh, it, it can change overnight, it's, you know, uh, so you always rely on the founder to kind of take, carry the, the team forward. So that's why the founder team is so important. And, and be able to execute fast and be able to understand the market, that's very, very important. Yeah, because the the, the oper operational excellence in, in China is very, very key if you want to succeed there. So we've got time yeah. for about one more question from the floor. If not, I have a question to end this up with. And that is, um, do you think that we're going to see a proportional slowdown in startup companies as the economy slows from 10% to 7%? Or are we actually going to see more startup companies in China and actually sort of, where's the, how's the resources going to reallocate? And June, why don't you take that first and Henri-Claude uh, about really, are we going to see more entrepreneurism in China over the next 10 years? I mean, it's been an incredibly entrepreneurial place. Right for the last yeah. Yeah. however many years, yeah. June. What's your take? Um, that's again, it's a difficult question. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I won't say I am able to predict the next, what happened in the next ten years, but I, I would say the entrepreneurs will always uh, will happen, uh, and probably more so now 
and in the future than the past. Because if you look at the trend, of the, the, the countries and the policies are supporting, uh, have the policy more opened up. For example, they allow the private-owned bank, the, you know, the crowdfunding, and you know, different areas, and they, they start opening the, the new policy to allow private uh, startups to, to happen. So that's why I think uh, if you look at this trend, the, the, uh, the uh, startups will come. And also because of the uh, economic restructuring, the government needs support, you know, in order to support uh, employment, they will rely on the new uh, startups coming up. But year over year, um, there's always, you know, wave, right? Yeah, and right. and yeah, right now, I think the current, currently the valuation in China is pretty high. The asset, all the assets are pretty high. We don't know when it will cool down uh, or whether it will cool down. Uh, but at some point, <laughs> it might have an adjustment. <laughs> I don't know when it, it will come. Yeah. But you know, it's, but business always have cycle, right? So, and some okay. of the great companies actually start during the downtime. Right. Yeah. Professor de Bettinier, comments about where we're going from here? No, I think uh, I subscribe to what the June is. Uh, Suggesting, I, I think it, it is a, a quite a good time to uh, go into China for a startup to, to develop. There are so many, as you said, so many opportunities. I think the business is going to become a little bit more transparent, not as transparent as we would like it to be, possibly. But uh, as, as, uh, what is uh, taking place today is going to reduce somewhat the opacity of uh, the uh, network and decision-making process. And in that sense, uh, it will make uh, for a startup maybe less difficult. It will be a system which will be less distant from the one that we know on this side. And second, um, you mentioned that uh, uh, the situation uh, creates more ethical management. Um, I think possibly, and if that is the case, it will also reduce a little bit the difficulties to operate. And to your question <coughs> about what kind of team do you need, I think uh, June gave you a, a good answer. I would say that uh, your uh, startup entrepreneur uh, getting from the Silicon Valley uh, to go to work in Beijing in uh, one of the uh, to develop this business in Beijing, we need to have a good insight uh, into the way the system functions, the capacity to empathize with the system. Because even if the system is changing, it does not necessarily make it easier to understand because the dynamics of change is rather complex. And we need to have an entrepreneur with a sense of uh, a feel for what is happening. And the fact that he's an overseas Chinese having been living in the United States for the last 15 or 20 years does not necessarily make him the most uh, uh, empathic to the particular environment. So I think we should choose people who have this capacity to understand the local environment and out of that uh, to get the signal with the they need to develop their startup and transfer their know-how and have this entrepreneurial drive that we need. I think that's a wonderful comment to close on today about empathy for the system and, and the situation there. Please join me in a warm round of applause for our great panel.